Welcome everyone. I'm Victor Flatt with the Environment, Energy and Natural Resources Center at the University of Houston Law Center. Um, we are happy to welcome you to our program. We're going to start by uh, introducing the program itself uh, from the originator and manager of it, uh, Professor Nzao. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Flatt. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session with our guest speaker from Rutgers University. I'm Moben Zau, and I'm delighted to say a few words about our program, which is funded by the European Commission through the H2020 and the Mercury programs. Our next speakers in the series will be uh, Professor Daniel Megro from John Hopkins University and uh, Professor um, Michael Vanderberg from Vanderbilt University, and that will be uh, in March. Please visit our website, www. Center, where you will find the main event, uh, a great lineup of our past, uh, sessions and uh, speakers. Feel free to use the chat box for um, uh, your questions, and in due course, I will be displaying uh, the CLE credits. Uh, from now on, I'll turn it over to Professor Victor Flat, uh, our um, our co our chair this morning and the co-director of the Inner Center. Thank you. Um, and I would like to again welcome all of you. We're very excited to be hosting this program. Um, and uh, I, I think um, uh, your video went out for just a bit. Uh, so I'm going to give you everybody the um, uh, address again. It's www.uh, uh, I'm sorry, www.law.uh.edu slash inner center, one word. And you can see that spelled right up above me. Uh, so please go, and we have an amazing um, uh, repository of our prior speakers, um, and uh, you can find out more about our upcoming speakers. But today, I'm most excited about our current speaker, uh, Professor Sami Payne. Um, we, in, in, in thinking about energy transition and climate, we often think about all of the energy and environmental issues that go on that we see all around us. Very often, we don't pay as much attention as to what goes on um, in the oceans. And yet the oceans hold essentially 95% of life <laughs> on our planet. Um, and to the extent historically, we as environmental people or international environmental people have looked at the oceans, it has been as a commons issue, fisheries, et cetera, et cetera, which of course is still a, a, a big issue and a big problem and has led to most of the negotiations around the use of our oceans. But like everything else today, the use of our oceans um, also impacts climate, uh, both in ways to mitigate uh, upcoming climate change and in ways to help adapt to climate change. And as such an important part of life on Earth, it becomes the uh, incredibly important part of our discussions in um, how the world is managing uh, resources, energy, environment, and climate. Our speaker today, that I'm very happy to introduce is Simi Payne. She's the Associate Professor in the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences and the School of Law at Rutgers University. And she has appeared as counsel before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in its deep seabed mining and IUU fisheries advisory opinion cases. She's an expert on environmental reparations at the International Court of Justice. She is currently legal advisor to uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature's delegation to the Intergovernmental Conference for a legally binding agreement on conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. She's also chair of the Ocean Law Specialist Group at the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. She's been a member of the Berkeley Law Faculty and served as attorney with the U.S. Department of the Interior, the law firm of Goodwin Proctor and the United Nations Security Council's Environmental uh, War Reparations Program. She holds her MA from the Fletcher School of Diplomacy, uh, Law and Diplomacy and JD from the University of California at Berkeley. So we're so happy to have you with us. I mean, I've, I've, as you know, we've, we've known each other for a while. I've followed your work for a long time. So really looking forward to the presentation. As um, Oban noted, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. 
luckily we have a small group so we can have some informal give and take and uh, you can ask questions in person as well but i'll call on people when that time comes so i'm going to turn the program over to professor Payne. well thank you so much victor Alba. um it's a huge pleasure to be here uh, the only thing that would be better would be to be with you in person but um that cannot be at the moment so I will enjoy this. Now, I'm going to try to share my screen and I'm going to rely on you all. Yes, okay, we did it right. Excellent. Um, first Zoom hurdle left over. Um, so, my topic today is revolving around something that I think we talk about a fair amount in our field. It's this question of areas of legal expertise that are sometimes siloed. And that extends to the policy realm too, of course. Um, in this case, I wanna talk about the UN climate regime, the law of the sea, and a new treaty, the new treaty that Victor alluded to, to implement the Law of the Sea Convention with the goal of protecting marine biodiversity in the global ocean, particularly the area beyond national jurisdiction. And I'd also like to make some suggestions at the end about what needs to be done in the next year or two, um, because this is a moment in time when we have the opportunity to actually inflect change through the legal documents that are being drafted right now. So the new treaty is intended to be a legally binding international agreement, and it has these two parts of conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in these areas beyond national jurisdiction. I'm repeating that because I'm gonna call it from now on the BBNJ agreement by biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So my title, Governing Climate Change in Marine Biodiversity Loss, Can We Walk and Chew Gum at the Same Time? is the expression of my frustration with a comment that I hear all too often, which is along the lines of, Global warming will wipe out biodiversity anyway, so let's not deal with that until we've managed climate change. <sighs> I'll try to show you why that's maybe not something we can wait for. So diplomats will be meeting like this again at the United Nations next month. They'll be coming from Canada, from Russia, China, the US, small island developing states like Micronesia, from South Africa, from Algeria, from Colombia, the European Union, and even from landlocked Switzerland to negotiate this new environmental agreement that will deal with about 40% of the Earth's surface. And some of these people will have been in Glasgow back in November to discuss climate change. Some will be preparing to head next to China for the April meeting at the Convention on Biological Diversity. Some of them will be just coming down the street because they're the legal officers in uh, the New York mission to the UN and they have a portfolio that isn't specialized at all. Some of them are specialists in law of the sea, which if you studied law of the sea, you know, mostly doesn't deal with environmental issues. It's much more focused on uh, the territorial zoning of the ocean and navigation and topics like that. Um, some of them are deeply knowledgeable about environmental treaties. And there we've noticed in the negotiations sort of on that floor that you're looking at there that we are sometimes talking at cross purposes um, when people are coming from these different expertises and it's not explicitly apparent. So I wanna make it absolutely clear that the problem, one of the problems that we need to address and that we can address in the present is that these three regimes, the climate tr change treaty regime with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Agreement and the Paris Agreement, the biodiversity regime, the 
Convention on Biological Diversity, which every country in the world except the United States belongs to, um, and the new Ocean Biodiversity Treaty that we're working on aren't integrated with each other, but they need to be since the earth systems they attempt to manage are intimately connected. And I suspect that many of you like me are wrestling with how do we actually do earth systems governance? Much more complicated than the problem that people of my generation started out with of how do we get rid of this particular pollutant in that particular river, right? Um, so this is trying to tackle that. So let's turn to why we're seeking a new treaty, how we expect it to work to support marine biodiversity, and then how maybe it could address some of the climate change mitigation and adaptation issues. Um, and then how law of the sea and climate change contribute to this. So isn't the law of the sea convention that we have, which is incredibly long, this is, uh, it's, this is it, right? This is enormous. Um, isn't that enough? No. Um, and so we tend to see the ocean from this perspective. This is the high seas that we're looking at, right? From my airplane window, not much going on down there. But actually, what we are learning with the science that has developed since the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated is that it is full of life. We're making continuous discoveries about it. In terms of its physical nature, this map shows the ocean as it truly is, one connected body of water that dominates the surface of the planet, connecting coastal waters and the open ocean. So we're pretty much all familiar with the coastal waters, and I am still trying to get out into the open ocean, much harder to access. This is 70% of the planet's surface. Did you know that we have more water territory in the United, that comprising the United States than we have land territory? So we just don't see it. It has complex canyons, abyss, abysses, and plains that slope up to shallower zones near the continents. And it's connected vertically from the air above down through the water columns, twilight zone, and into the sub seafloor sediments. Uh, the images here are from Rebecca Helm's research on the Neuston, which is life at that very interface where the air meets the water. And it includes everything from the Portuguese man of war to sargassum weed and uh, microbes. Their high seas are connected across the oceans. Leatherback turtle visits 32 different countries. The great white shark and the Pacific bluefin tuna roam across the seas. And many birds either migrate across the ocean, some even spend most of their life on the high seas. So that means that many countries need to cooperate in conservation. Ocean life forms are also connected to deep time. Many deep sea creatures grow slowly and live long. Blue whales can live to be 90 years old. Some life forms are believed to be hundreds of years old and slow growing life forms tend to reproduce slowly, making them vulnerable. We use the ocean in many ways. We use it for food. We benefit from the way it controls the climate. It helps us with that. Um, specifically, I should pause on that. The ocean absorbs heat from the atmosphere, which has spared us a lot of the temperature impacts so far of um, climate change. And it also absorbs about 26% of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide emitted each year into the atmosphere. Humans use the ocean for, uh, th this antique looking map is actually a modern map of a very modern thing. And Victor has a slight smile, so I'm guessing that he knows that this is a map of submarine cables 
that these fiber optic cables carry 95% of our international internet communications. And they provide essential communications links for countries like Australia, New Zealand, and small island states like Tonga. Um, unfortunately, their extensive networks are vulnerable to damage from ships anchors, and from trawlers fishing for bottom-dwelling species. This is a snapshot of global marine traffic based on the automatic tracking system that ships are required to carry. And I, I think it is indicative of the density of ship traffic in sensitive areas of highly diverse and unique ecosystems. And our land-based activities that cause greenhouse gas pollution is a threefold for threat for the ocean. Warm, all that warming, that absorption of the heat that has spared terrestrial species is affecting and changing the habitats of ocean species, causing them to migrate or perish. <clears throat> Acidification, the carbon dioxide that's absorbed is changing the pH of the ocean and destroying the bodies of essential life forms affecting primary production. Deoxygenation, which is another function of this, can cause catastrophic food web collapse. And all of these things don't affect just the biodiversity of the ocean, but human health, survival, and can lead to conflict, conflicts over fisher, migrating fisheries, for instance. Um, deep seabed mining, is a new way of potentially exploiting the ocean that is just beginning. Um, and in his talk on carbon dioxide sequestration, CDS, earlier in this seminar series, Will Burns, which is incidentally a terrific presentation, and if you haven't looked at it, you should, um, described new geoengineering industries that are interested in exploiting the ocean with various techniques to store carbon. So other technologies that might take place in the ocean um, and that would have a potential effect on life in the ocean include solar radiation management by placing aerosols of sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere. Um, so we have all this you know, important life in the ocean and physical functions, lots of human activities that are on the uptick. And we also have um, an interesting scientific lens to help us think about Earth systems. So this is um, one of my favorite diagrams. The map is just a decoration. What we're really seeing is a spiderweb graph of nine different planetary systems. And the green is where the estimated safe space is for those systems. And they're measured obviously in different metrics. The red is showing where, where those metrics are approaching or exceeding those boundaries. So this is from the 2009 Rockstrom and colleagues uh, paper um, on the safe operating space for humanity. And their idea was that these boundaries um, are the points at which our impacts on the earth push it past the stable environment that nurtured humans for the last 10,000 years. And what you can see is that three that have been, or two that have been exceeded are biodiversity and climate. And the third that we're approaching is ocean acidification. This brings us back to the need to intervene. How do we manage the ocean now? Not too much. Um, in 1973, a conference, this conference was convened to codify the existing law of the sea and to develop it further in some respects. The law of the sea convention is now somewhat outdated. As I mentioned, back in the 1970s, the negotiators didn't realize that there was very rich life in the deep ocean, nor that human technology could deplete the oceans and other marine resources. So Article 7, 87, this is Article 87 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, it declares the freedoms of the high seas for use, the right of all states to fish, navigate, and lay pipelines and cables with, now this is kind of 
that we weren't talking about sustainable development then, but there's kind of a sustainable development piece that comes in even with this somewhat outdated convention, do regard for the interests of other states. That has been a weak peg to hang conservation and sustainability on, but it is there in this treaty. Also through the law of the sea convention, states extended their sovereign rights to the seas 200 miles from their coastal baseline and even beyond where a state has an extended continental shelf. So that's the zone where fish and minerals are the most accessible. The dark blue that you see on this map shows that exclusive economic zone, the 200 mile zone. And the light blue is the high seas. That's the remaining shared ocean, as I said, about 40%. Um, and it, that is a global commons where no nation can claim sovereignty. That is the area beyond national jurisdiction that the new treaty will apply to. It covers nearly two thirds of the ocean and about half the planet. It's the largest habitat for life on earth by volume, about 90%. It's only 1% protected. In legal terms, um, it's a global commons, but that's a very loose term, right? So. There's, uh, from an economic perspective, it's an open access commons where governance and sustainable use are very difficult to implement. In other legal concepts that are useful to think about here, it's common area, the high seas. Um, it's a common concern. The Convention on Biological Diversity refers to the common concern as the basis for protecting biodiversity under international law. And the law of the sea convention declared the resources of the seabed in this area and its subsoil to be the common heritage of mankind. What that did um, it, by including that in the text, the way they included it, established an administrative framework to share the benefits of deep seabed mining when it eventually begins to take place. And the convention also includes some general principles of protection of the marine environment. It states that the freedom of the seas are, are to be exercised with due regard for the interests of other states, and it invokes these other obligations that appear in various parts of the convention referring to protection and preservation of the marine environment, pollution prevention, and environmental impact assessment as a requirement. But although this the convention provides rules, some rules and exhortations, it doesn't have treaty bodies. You know, we're all used now to hearing about the COP ha happening at the end of every year and everyone rushes off somewhere to talk about climate change. The COP is the conference of the parties. So it's the the, both the body of all the states' parties to the treaty, and it can be the occasion on which those states' parties convene to discuss implementation of whatever the relevant treaty is. There's no such thing for the Law of the Sea Convention. So it doesn't have that modality to actually work on specific issues to interpret through discussions and resolutions of the part, states' parties, um, what, what this text possibly could mean in modern circumstances. It also has no secretariat. It has no formal scientific body to help update it. Um, if you're familiar with the Montreal Protocol, you might think about that as a process that is the one of the best at integrating new scientific knowledge and staying current. Okay, There is widespread agreement that the ocean should be protected and managed in some way. Goal 14 of the sustain, sustainable development goals that were adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2015 is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources. Okay, But that's soft law. Um, it's helpful, but it's not um, sufficient. The governance regime, I mentioned that there are hundreds of 
agreements of different kinds, especially sort of industrial sectoral agreements about shipping and about fishing, um, they are unfortunately fragmented. These two maps show the jurisdiction of the several fisheries management organizations. Um, the one on the left is the tuna organizations and the one on the right is regional organizations. Um, they don't, you know, although they exist, these organizations exist, they're often focused on the target species and they don't address the full spectrum of biodiversity. They don't even necessarily address bycatch. So some species are just thrown away. This is actually a problem for coastal fisheries. For instance, if you look off of um, the west coast of Africa, there's a very rich fishery there that's extremely important for the protein needs of this part of Africa. And yet the failure to manage adequately the offshore fisheries there has been, which is a global responsibility, has seriously harmed the coastal fisheries. So there's, um, it's not just a climate change issue, you know, this is really broad. So the recognition that ocean biodiversity is at risk, that our current approach is inadequate, led the UN member states to begin negotiation of the new treaty in September, 2018. And this is, it has a very short resolution of the General Assembly saying, we're going to do this. And there are these four issues in the package. So what are they? And this seems a little weird. When I first started working on this, I was like, wait, this is this huge treaty that's supposed to deal with biodiversity on most of the planet. And this is what we're talking about. Um, okay, so let's say it's a political compromise. Um, but let me explain a little bit why this might be of interest in use. So the four elements are environmental assessment, area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, marine dealing with marine genetic resources, access and benefit sharing. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that but briefly and capacity building and technology transfer. Um, I should say also that the um, negotiation was delayed by COVID. It should have finished last year, but uh, that wasn't possible. So the first strategy is to subject activities that might cause significant harm to an environmental impact assessment. Now, I hope that everybody listening to this loves NEPA as much as I do, um, but I'm pretty sure that that's not true. <laughs> The treaty text would look familiar to you. It follows the main steps of the US National Environmental Policy Act. The analysis that's done on proposed activities should include cumulative impacts. Although concern about the difficulty of cumul cumulative effects analysis has been expressed repeatedly. And I invite anybody who's interested in that topic to get in touch with me because there's some really useful work to be done there or, or go ahead and write papers and um, help us address that because um, it's not simple, but it's important. Climate change is a really important factor, you know, the, including projections of warming, acidification, deoxygenation, relocation of species, shifting ocean currents, freshening of seawater as sea ice melts, and other factors do need to be considered when you look at the impact of a particular activity on this mar marine biodiversity in these areas beyond national jurisdiction. So all the information that's collected through the EIA process will be shared through an online clearinghouse. There's wide agreement on this basic procedure, but there are still significant differences between governments on two issues. A few more issues, but these are key issues. One is whether any activity that might have a significant effect on areas beyond national jurisdiction, wherever they occur, are covered. Some governments, including the US, are reluctant to have activities that occur within their national jurisdiction 
be subject to this requirement of an international environmental impact assessment. Um, and the, uh, the other issue is whether the host state for the activity has the role of deciding whether or not to allow the activity if it's shown to have a harmful impact, projected to have a harmful impact, or whether that decision can be made by the states that are parties to the treaty. And I think you can see why um, states are very reluctant uh, to put that kind of decision in the hands of an international body. The second approach is, uh, to dealing with conservation of marine biodiversity is to increase the ecological resilience of biodiversity of the, the actual critters to withstand impacts from greenhouse gas pollution and other harms that can't be reduced directly. So we have this huge problem. We know we've got the juggernaut of climate change that is going to continue. Even if we do everything that we wanna to do to address that through mitigation strategies, we're still gonna have impacts on the ocean that we simply are helpless to alter at this point. But by establishing high seas marine protected areas, this should provide some element of climate change adaptation. So consider the analogy to your health, right? If you haven't had enough sleep, you haven't been eating a good diet, you might be more susceptible to catching the cold if you're exposed to the virus. Um, similarly, you know, let's say fish populations are already shifting to other parts of the ocean as the water temperature heats up due to climate change. That means that animals that prey on them may have to travel further to find food. And we can't do anything in the near term to control seawater temperature. But if we reduce fishing effort by humans and we divert ships around the region where these predators live so that they suffer less mortality from ship strikes, they may be more resilient. Okay, so it makes a certain sense, I hope you see. The third approach in the treaty is to provide resources to build capacity for developing states to participate in the treaty's activities and supporting transfer te of technology. Now there's another element to that which um, has to do with marine genetic resources. This is an issue that is worthy of an entire seminar series on its own, which would deal a lot with equity and with intellectual property. Um, and with technology. So I'm not gonna say that much about it, but it's a very contentious issue of sharing access to and benefits from the marine genetic resources from living things that are located in the global commons outside of any sovereign territory. They can be turned into, the, the genetic information in these unusual creatures can be turned into, um, products, useful products, but through the intervention of a lot of technology. And so there are real differences of views about how this should be handled. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about it to the extent that uh, my expertise goes on that. Um, there's cross-cutting institutional structures that uh, cross-cutting issue, issues of a number of kinds, the institutional structures are an important one. So we're, we'll have a conference of the parties within this treaty, which will make it different from what I said about the Law of the Sea Convention. There will actually be a regular meeting place and convening of states to be able to uh, progress. And um, there will be a secretariat to support the activities of the Conference of the Parties and other bodies. There'll be a clearinghouse mechanism to create a major public information resource that we hope will also integrate a lot of the ocean observation information so that we can bring the law and the science more closely together. Um, we also are 
almost certain to have some kind of scientific and technical body. And this is really where international environmental lawmaking is different from international lawmaking in general, because for the environment, we have to deal with the great scientific uncertainty about the reality, cause, and extent of the problems we deal with. Management of these ecosystems that can adapt to changing conditions due to climate change, human interventions, and other phenomena at a, other levels of complexity. So um, we, we will have, I think, some kind of a scientific body to advise the parties. So what about, so if we focus on climate change specifically within this context, um, as we saw, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea didn't con contemplate climate change at all. Although the general obligations of marine environmental protection are relevant, could be invoked, but they generally are not considered a strong platform. Um, we may see we may see differently with some of the proposals for advisory opinions um, that are being crafted for uh, the international courts. But um, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea doesn't provide the institutions or processes to facilitate collective action. So the BBNJ agreement could, which is I should be clear also, it is intended to be an implementing agreement to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So this is part of this framework agreement uh, where the Law of the Sea Convention sets out principles, uh, dispute resolution measures, a number of other things like that. And then under that, there are protocols. So there's a fisheries agreement, there's an agreement on deep seabed mining. This would be the third implementing agreement to UNCLOSE. And so it has to be consistent with UNCLOSE, but it can fill some of the gaps, but it can only do that if it is endowed with robust institutions and a mandate that encompasses activities in the high seas from different industrial sectors. And as you can imagine, um, different industries have been advocating to say, well, no, really fishing shouldn't be included in that because we have all these other fisheries treaties. And yeah, deep seabed mining, no, we have a whole deep seabed mining thing. No, you, we should exclude that and, and so on. Uh, shipping, no, we have the International Maritime Organization that does that. Um, so really th this is, we expect treaty text to be adopted this year, probably not at the March meeting, um, there'll probably be a meeting in August. And so at this point, for the United States to take a leadership role and for you know, Europe to take a leadership role for them to join with groups like the coalitions from Africa, uh, the coalitions of states from the Pacific, small island developing states, and ensure that this is a robust, strong, comprehensive, integrating treaty will be really important. Um, but this is the other threat. It's the, the, this is the language in the treaty man, uh, negotiation mandate that is put in there um, potentially to protect those industrial sectors. And it says this process and its results should not undermine existing relevant legal instruments and frameworks and relevant global, regional, and sectoral bodies. In other words, leave us alone. Um, you know, we can flip this language on its head and say, well, you know, that may be how you see it, but we're not undermining. We're supporting your mandate. Your mandates are to sustainably manage your resources. So um, let's think of it that way. Um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change doesn't provide the answer on how to deal with climate change in the ocean. It includes, but it doesn't focus on the ocean. So the preamble to UNFCCC says, aware of the role and importance in terrestrial and marine ecosystems of sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases. 
Okay, that's sort of, um, and it then in article four, which is the commitments section that states should promote sustainable management, promote and cooperate in the conservation and enhancement of sinks and reservoirs. And it includes oceans and other terrestrial coastal and marine ecosystems. Okay, so not much has been done under that. Um, and the Paris Agreement doesn't even really carry through the UNFCCC obligation. Um, it's a little disheartening when you search the text, you know, and for ocean, marine, something. <laughs> it's got to be in there. This is the one mention um, of the ocean in the Paris Agreement, and including the oceans. Um, and that's although Article 5 two of the paragraph two of the Paris Agreement does have details, a lot of details on how forest carbon sinks are to be conserved. Still, there's a hook there and it's one that we can build on. And the, um, actually one of the things I, I was just working on this week um, is the ocean clim and climate change dialogues. So this has become part of the climate cops and at those meetings, now there's, um, a, I think, an effort that we can start pushing again to be more concrete, more engaged, less rhetorical, uh, get more legal input into it um, in that ocean and climate change dialogue. So to summarize, um, there really are two big efforts in front of us. One is to include the ocean systematically in our climate change work and understanding that the ocean has a physical reality, it has a biological reality. And I didn't get into this, but there is amazing science about the linkage between those two, how the physical and biological interact. Um, the other is to adopt a robust bb and j agreement um, so i have kind of a summary slide here um, the potential for including the ocean in ndc's nationally determined contributions under paris uh, in the global stock take that is a place if any of you are involved in the global stock take this is when it's being prepared and making sure that uh, all dimensions of ocean is included in that, contributing to the uh, dialogues. Um, you know, remembering that UNCLOS is a treaty that is very important, it's very well accepted. And so although it doesn't bring a lot to the table, it is still a very potent source of law that can be used. And the BB&J, if it we have high ambition, can offer an integrated approach. So I had, threw in a slide that you can refer to later about all the upcoming meetings. But for now, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I look forward to questions and discussion. And I'm going to stop sharing as soon as I can find my stop share. There we go. OK. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was that you really covered a lot <laughs> and brought up a lot of interesting questions. And I have quite a few, but I want to actually start uh, with a question from our chat. And by the way, please put your questions in the chat. But we also have a relatively small group. So if you feel comfortable, oh, here's the CLE course reporting information. Thank you all that. Um, but if you're comfortable, you can also raise your hand and be recognized and you can ask your, your question uh, directly. Um, so just to start with the question that is in the chat, it is about looking to the U.S. for leadership uh, and why we should look to the U.S. for leadership on anything implementing this agreement for biodiversity on the high seas uh, when it still hasn't ratified um, the CBD for biodiversity on land and coastal waters. It hasn't ratified UNCLOSE um, and where implementation uh, on the high seas is going to be even harder. Um, so, and, and you didn't exactly say the U.S. is leading the way, but what do you have to say about, about that observation? 
Well, the U.S. has one of the largest influences. It's, it's it, the country that has the greatest potential to, no, not the greatest, that's too much, but great potential to influence what actually happens. Um, and, and that's for a number of reasons. For one thing, um, the U.S. is a huge coastal nation. We have lots of activities out on the ocean that we undertake. We have in general, not actually been such bad actors in terms of ocean activities. Um, the US fishing policies are pretty good. The US actually says that, although we haven't ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, we did sign it under President Clinton. And we say it's, it represents customary international law and we abide by it. That means we can't participate in the organizations like the Law of the Sea Tribunal or the International Seabed Authority. We won't, uh, if we don't ratify the BBNJ agreement, then we won't be able to participate in the Conference of the Parties and the scientific and technical body. So we kind of cut off our nose to spite our face but we do act as though we are parties to these agreements in other ways. Um, I, I also speak about the US because I'm, I'm in the US. For the most part, my engagement since, I don't know, 2016 or around there in this treaty has been through the lens of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is an intergovernmental organization that it's actually a hybrid organization that includes state members and NGO members. And there I'm thinking about this as an international legal expert, not as an American. But now that we're getting closer to the potential for adopting text and we wanna have support for the treaty, um, I, I'm starting to think about it as an American. And you know, in one reason, one way, in all candor, I embraced the opportunity to give this talk because I think it's really important that people are aware that this is coming up and it's a major responsibility and it's one that our government could take up. Um, we may not, but... Um, one more thing I actually would say in, in favor of the US, I, um, I, I'm willing to beat up on the US as much as the next guy, but um, the US actually does really, really good environmental impact assessment. You know, NEPA nailed it and it's now considered an international legal obligation, but we started that and we know how to do it. And we really, let's, let's do this stuff, right? We can do it. Um, if we do it well, then that that will advance things. It seems that we've uh, it, it seems like we've lost uh, Victor, but I'm going to uh, end the floor to Jake Rice, who raised his hand. Okay, I actually had lowered my hand. I want. I was the one who posed the question in the chat about challenging the US. Um, well, Jake, those of you, can you, yeah, can you say a little bit more? Because I, you know, I'm giving the sort of pro okay, well, uh, optimist pitch, but tell me, tell me more. Okay, I, I will, um, for people who don't know me, um, I would have been retired for six years now. I was chief scientist for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. I went as a member of the Canadian delegation to every BBNJ ad hoc working group of the whole until I retired. I was on the group of ex the 15 group of experts for the regular process, um, which you didn't get mentioned in your thing, but it is, has been an ongoing assessment of the ocean in the high seas. It's finished its third world ocean assessment, each of which has gone to the UN General Assembly for information and been treated seriously. I've been on two IPCC assessments, including the special report for the ocean cryosphere. 
and now two um, IPBES, the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services assessments, including co-chairing the one for the Americas and head of the conceptualization part of the sustainable use. So that's the perspective I bring to this. And it was a very interesting talk. Um, I'm not as pessimistic as you are with regard to the degree of science and assessments being done already in the oceans and the high seas mm -hmm. and how seriously those results are being taken by the relevant institutions, by the CBD in its conference of parties, by the RMFOs in the work they do, and I work with several of them, um, and by UNGA in their um, annual discussions that go into their ocean decisions, um, that we have a lot to build on. And I have as much hope as you do for an ambitious um, BBNJ treaty, um, can, um, implementing agreement that brings these things together. I think the complexities of balancing sustainable use and conservation in the high seas are no smaller than they are on land, mm -hmm. particularly because the realities of surveillance and enforcement and things like that are going to be so much more difficult. Mm -hmm. But I just think we're a lot closer to something that will work than people who aren't following this closely might have drawn from the talk you gave. I don't see the situation as being as pessimistic as you do. And I think I'm reasonably well informed from the science perspective on where we are and from being at so many BBNJ negotiations on where they are as well. So those are just some thoughts I'd like to share. Thank you very much for sharing them. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And I see, you know, sort of what turned your hair gray too. Uh, that this is, and I think one thing- I was at the original Rio convention. <laughs> <laughs> it goes that, back that far. Apologies for getting bumped off. I'm glad you all were able to keep going. Yes, you're going to have to go back and listen to what Jake just said, because okay. it was really- really interesting and valuable. There has been a tremendous scientific effort going on and the integrated ocean assessments that Jake is referring to that are kind of developed through the regular process are amazing resources. So for scholars, academics, students, you should know about those. Um, and I wanna thank you for your work on this because it's, um, it takes the kind of persistent, consistent engagement that you've had to make this stuff work. Um, I'm, um, yeah, I'm sorry if I sounded too, too pessimistic. Um, we're, we're at a moment now where we're looking at the text and we're thinking, oh my God, we've got to get this stuff resolved. Um, but, but thank you very much for that. I just leave what you said a uh, stand that uh, we appreciate. Thank you. And again, apologies for, <laughs> for technological glitches. Thank you, more, more uh, Wi-Fi things. Um, I actually had a very specific question that I was wondering if you could address. Um, so just this last week, I believe it was that Senator Lisa Murkowski called for the US to support uh, deep seabed mining for purposes of, oh, you didn't know that, <laughs> for purposes of uh, materials for the energy transition, essentially materials, you know, cobalt, lithium for batteries, um, for renewable things, etc. And of course, the expected response was that was not a particularly popular thing with many environmentalists, because there are still many environmental issues that we know exist around deep seabed mining. And as, as you said, the US is not a party down close, but it does um, accept it as customary law. Um, do you, so I, I guess I'll back up one, one point. 
is the the push for new mining and metals going to accelerate the desire for deep sea bed mining? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, there's actually, there's a good podcast series that the American Bar Association National Security Podcast um, that's worth taking a look at. There's um, a representative of the mining company that's leading the charge on deep seabed mining in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, so their lawyer speaks, Matt Gianni, who um, works on the conservation side speaks. I, I think I mean, the, the lawyer for the mining company says, oh, we, you know, we have to have this stuff for the industry, for the energy transition. Yeah, I cut that out in the interest of time as I was talking. I was going to comment on this. Um, but the, um, we have to have these minerals from the deep seabed in the interests of the energy transition. And then the, the lawyer for the mining company also said, and if we don't take them, Russia and China will which is always a good reason to go and wreck the environment, right? Because someone else is going to wreck it if I don't. Uh, Matt Gianni lays out much more uh, complexity, the issues. And I think the biggest concern here is that, uh, and this really does go to the title of the talk, right? That, uh, okay, so that we can get some minerals so that we can drive more electric cars, we're going to go and wipe out because this kind of mining wipes out all life in the areas of the seabed where it takes place. And it's been, the little bit of work that's been done has showed virtually no recovery over 30 years, I think. But I'd actually like to give Jake a couple of minutes if he's willing to also comment on that from the science perspective. Um, but do you mind? <laughs> Um, excuse me. I, I don't mind commenting from the science perspective. Um, and I say this having just signed a contract with the um, ISA to do a report for them on seabed mining and fishery interactions. Um, I'm not saying that any industry, and I'm not singling out seabed mining as being any better or any worse than any other one, will be completely candid about their long-term goals for how large they claim they want to expand. Right now, when you read what the ISA says, the parts of the seabed which, where deep sea mining is likely, because it's extremely complex, extremely expensive to conduct and they're only going they're only considering areas where their payoffs are going to be extremely high they would argue they would argue that the area they will impact is a very small fraction of the total seabed unfortunately exactly because of what they're looking for the areas they impact will be some of the most special places in the deep sea seabed. And um, that's where they plan right now in the economy of the early 2020s. Uh, to, um, what we're going to face as we creep up on 2050 um, and the options that are available to us then to choose as a society where we want to meet the needs for the different things. For example, just your point about they're going after some very specific minerals to deal with making electric cars more efficient, electric batteries more efficient. If our need, if that's the solution we want for climate change, if we don't take those minerals out of the ocean, the size of the footprint we're going to make on land, finding the minerals that will be necessary will be just as big a concern. It just won't go away by saying you can't have them from the ocean. And these are not the kinds of discussions that I'm seeing going on anywhere. That if we don't need those, yeah, how do we not need the minerals? Not a matter of 
oh, you can't take them from the ocean, find them somewhere else. We're running out of somewhere else's if we're already looking 3,000 meters down the ocean. Yeah, thank you so much for, for being willing to uh, comment sort of on the fly there. That, that's really helpful. I think the last thing I'd say about that is that um, I heard a very interesting presentation from a group that deals, it was an NGO that deals with mining on land and they do some seabed mining issues. And their comment was very pertinent to what Jake just said, that what we need to do is reduce our need for those minerals, not keep looking for them in other places. So that might include, um, well, on the one hand, companies that are saying we, we're looking for other kinds of battery technologies. So that's the technology development piece. The other piece is mass transit, fewer personal cars, you know, let's thinking about how to deal with the demand side of this. So great question. Uh, okay. Um, um, one quick question. Uh, what role uh, in the course of the negotiations um, of the BNG agreement, uh, what role for the non-state actors and uh, uh, NGOs, the big ones and even the lo uh, locally based uh, organizations? Ah, thank you, Evan. That's a great question. So especially right now. Um, so throughout the negotiation, it's been very transparent, unusually transparent um, it, in that civil society observers have been able to be present, have been able to make interventions and have worked very closely in supporting um, different delegations, especially develop, uh, delegations from developing states that may not have access to a lot of expertise or you know, sort of um, providing that kind of engagement. Um, at the moment, so, and, and in the negotiations, there was also the um, really unusual step of normally there's the big plenary sessions and those are often broadcast publicly on the UN TV link. So you could have watched them from home, maybe you did. Um, but then they go into what they call informal informals. And that's usually a small session, closed door with just the governments. But they let um, both intergovernmental organization and non-governmental organizations come and observe those. Although I think there we weren't allowed to make interventions. And so that has contributed to a very open process. However, thanks to COVID, the UN no longer allows NGO observers into the building. So intergovernmental organizations like mine, like IUCN, can access the UN building, but NGOs can't go in at all. So Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund, Conservation International, no. Um, and for the meetings that are coming up in March, what we've been told is that delegations can, eat, these are the governments, can have one delegate in the room during the negotiation, which is problematic because often a delegation, if they can staff enough people, will have, you know, the person like the US will have the State Department people, the State Department lawyer, the person from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, you know, the, you know, patent trademark office will all be there sort of conferring and working. That's gonna be one person. And no observers at all will be allowed in the room. There'll be a web link. And so everyone, you all can watch um, on the web link, but at least I think you can. That's not 100% yet, but you can't make any comments. It's a one-way link. So this exclusion, there's a new letter from Greenpeace um, that was just published sort of about this. Um. Thank you so much. I apologize again for losing my connectivity, but before I lose it again, I'm afraid we're already past our time. And I know there were some other good questions. I'm really sorry about that. I'm, maybe I can direct those to you or we'll move the chat to you and you can respond. So I just wanna thank you again uh, for this wonderful program. It, the recording will be available. And uh, 
Uh, I hope you all join us again in March for our um, next uh, two speakers, which Obama spoke of earlier. So thank you all. And uh, again, this will be posted and we will try to get all the chat to Simi for her to look at and perhaps be able to respond to that. So thank you again. And thank you all everybody for your attendance. Thanks, bye-bye.